Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Film presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Not Responsible After 30 Years. I suppose I'm glad to be out again. It's close to Midsummer's Eve again. I've got a date for that night. I've been thinking about the day all the time I've been in Dartmoor. Planning how to get back to the circle and everything. And those three years have gone pretty slowly. Pretty slowly. Listen, the British prisons aren't like the ones at home. They don't fool around here. Well, they're fair, all right, I suppose, but British prison food isn't exactly what I'd order. And those gray uniforms stamped with a broad arrow are pretty depressing. In for? Why, I was in for stealing. For stealing a wristwatch, to be exact. Three years ago, just about this time of the year. Stealing a wristwatch. Off a skeleton's arm. Well, sure, I don't mind telling you. I was in the OWI this last war. I'd been in the other war first in the British Army. Oh, I'm an American. I just got kind of carried away in 1914. And when this one came along, I put in for OWI and made it. They sent me to England. I'd always wanted to come back to England all those 30 years since I first came here and enlisted in the Coileys. The King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry, K-O-Y-L-I, Coily. But you know how it is. You're in the advertising business. You've got accounts to look after. You go fishing in the summer with a client and all that. So the OWI was what you might call a heaven-sent opportunity. Well, anyway, forget the war if you can. I want to tell you about Midsummer's Day, 1945. This end of the war was over, you see. And so I put in for some leave, as I've been planning to do for the four years I've been in Britain. I got it easily enough. And I set out for the circle. The circle? I'll tell you about that in a minute. You wanted to know why I got put in jail. Okay. So when I got to the circle, it was a, it was a morning of Midsummer's Day. The 24th day of June in England, a quarter day. The morning after Midsummer Eve. Well, I hardly recognized the place well as I knew it. At first, I thought they were digging some kind of fortification or something. And then I remembered that the war was over, and why should they be digging air raid shelters or whatever it was now? And when I went closer, I discovered what was going on. That's an old Roman camp or something, sir. They found some old Roman soldiers down there. My heart turned over. Old Roman soldiers. A Roman camp. I remember the Ninth Spanish Legion of Tiberius Claudius. The Ninth Snails, the other Romans called them. 
And I remember the motto on the Eagle Standards of the Ninth, the bronze ribbon below the SPQR of the regular army. The words of the Ninth cherished and fought for. Slow but sure. The Ninth that helped defeat Caractacus, king of the Britons, 19 short years after Christ was crucified. And it stayed in Britain almost 400 years afterwards. Until the the very language of Rome disappeared. Disappeared among them except for the commands of the centurions that parade. I remembered so many things. And I drew nearer to the excavation where a couple of navvies were handing up a long canvas wrapped thing from the muddy clay. And I wasn't surprised at all when the man who seemed to be in charge unwrapped the canvas to reveal a skeleton of a man. His short bronze sword at his side. And on his left arm, dangling loosely from the muddy white ulna, an Elgin wristwatch of the vintage of 1915. Yes, of course the archaeologist was thunderstruck. No, nobody had lost a watch in the pit. No, it couldn't be anything but the skeleton's own watch. Well, they couldn't slip it off the bones of the hand. The metal band was too small, and it had corroded so that it couldn't be unstrapped. Nobody thought to ask the American in the OWI uniform if he knew anything about it. I could have told him a lot about it. I could have told him what they'd discover if they cleaned the watch and wound it up. I could have told him who the dead man was. And I could have told him that it wasn't his watch. After all, it was mine. So, I stole it. Of course, they caught me, and that was three years ago. Today, they let me out of Dartmoor with a little time off for good behavior. And tonight, I'm going to find that watch, and I'm going to steal it again. Then I'm going to clean it very, very carefully. And I'm coming back to the circle. And when the watch is wound and running, I hope it will run. Now, it's been underground there for 30 years. Or is it... Well, the Roman legions left Britain in the year 411 A.D., That's more than 1,500 years ago. Lance Corporal Edward Mullen was my friend. I was the only American in the battalion, and the hard-headed Yorkshire Dalesmen don't take up easily with foreigners. But Mullen, who had been my drill master, took rather a liking to me somehow. Then, between the chores of slow pipe and farm pours, two deep quick marks, we found quite a good deal in the way of common interest, particularly English history. We could see the towers of York Minster from our drill ground, and... But I wish you could meet Edward Mullen. Aye, lad. The old wall that Severus built in the year 208 ran straight across yon field over there. Aye. York's always been a garrison town. There was Severus, and then uh, Constantius about 100 years later. And, uh... Constantius, he died by under clump of trees, they say. Uh, I suppose they dig up a lot of Roman relics and stuff, huh? Around here? Oh, I Old pieces of armor, coins, and that sort of thing. And occasionally part of a skeleton. <laughs> this is a lively place in the old days, Yank. Yeah. I wish I had a chance to see more of it. Well, perhaps we could wangle a day off and have a decor of things. Wish we could. <laughs> Well, uh, Sergeant Major's an old pal of mine. See what I can do, eh? Oh, boy. Like it, eh? Not us. Uh, don't come that cockney stuff on me, lad. You know, I think bloody cold famous. Uh, where could we go, for instance, Corporal? You you know some places where we could find some stuff? Uh, you know, uh, a coin or something? Uh, I do and all. I know a score of places. Hey, ever hear of Druid? Druid? Sure. Used to go around in white robes with mistletoe in their hair and play harps and do magic tricks. 
Uh, I wouldn't be quite so flip about the Druids, Greg. What? You know, there's people about that take Druids somewhat serious. In this day and age? Aye. Oh. What'd you ask about him? Well, uh, uh, I know where there's a Druid circle. Where they used to meet? Aye. Where maybe they still meet. <laughs> oh, now, come on. You know what tomorrow night is, Greg? Uh, 23rd of June. Uh-huh. Have you got guts, Yank? Well, I suppose so. Guts enough to go to a Druid circle on Midsummer's Eve? Huh? Well, why not, for Pete's sake? Well, uh, you, you'll not get frightened and run away and leave me. Oh, of course I won't. Why should I? Well, it just might be, lad, that well, you might see something you might not be expecting, like. What? Well, I don't know. But I know a man, I knew a man from other fields over in the West Riding. He made a wager he'd stay all night alone in Druid Circle on Midsummer's Eve. And did he? They found him there in the morning. Well, what did he see? He couldn't tell. He could only just slobber like a baby. He was raving mad. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. Nobby Clark, his name was. From Othersfield. Hmm. Well... <laughs> Oh, I don't know. You have never seen a druid circle by moonlight. I want you to picture tall, wide-spreading oak trees, hundreds of years old. I want you to see a circle of great stones, twice as tall as a man, casting long black shadows across the grass. I want you to hear the little night wind rustling the leaves of the ancient oaks, sounding like the far-off, whispered conversation of a great conclave of beings from another world. See the moon, dead pale in the sky above, and feel the oneness of all nature in the whispering silences, and know that you are very close to an infinite something sense that you, who came to watch in the Druid Circle on Midsummer Eve, are being watched, and there is nothing to see, nothing but the grim old monoliths standing in a silent circle and their lengthening shadows reaching out to the two soldiers crouched under the low-hanging branches of the oaks. There is nothing to hear, nothing but the rustle of the leaves and the quickened the breathing of the man beside you in the dark. I looked at my watch. It lacked less than a minute of midnight. And as the hand slowly crept to the hour, a veil seemed to come over the moon, though the sky was cloudless, and there was the sound of a deep tone of the bell, clanging thunderously once and echoing across the empty grave. And suddenly the glade wasn't empty anymore. In the center of the circle stood an ancient man, a tall, straight man, robed in gleaming white with a wreath of mistletoe about his head and a long, silver-white beard that descended to his bosom. And I heard Edward Mullen's sharp intake of breath and his whisper in my ear, The Druid. And the majestic old man turned, and I could see his eyes gleaming in the moonlight as he gazed straight at us. And then he raised his staff and twined with oak leaves and brandished it. And from somewhere behind us, I heard the tread of marching men. It was a long time, it seemed to me, before I realized that these were not men in British Army ammunition boots, armed with Lee Enfields and bayonet short mark three. It wasn't until they marched out into the moonlight in the circle that I recognized them in their tight leather helmets and kilted battle dress 
with her lances aloft in their short run swords clanking at their hips. But I recognize them as a cohort of the legions of Rome of 1,500 years ago. I have not much memory of what happened after that for a while. I remember how the glade seemed to have changed, how the sagging monolith seemed to have straightened up, how there seemed to be more trees there than there had been at first. The shapes of the hills seemed altered somehow. And there was a high wall stretching across the field beyond us, a wall shoulder high, built of heavy stones and with guard platforms at regular intervals. I was looking at Severus Wall, built by the Romans in the year 208, and as I was to learn very shortly, now only a scant two centuries old. I heard Edward Mullen speaking to one of the legionaries. The British soldiers, friend. We may know him. And I heard the legionary reply to him. And the tongue he spoke was English of a fashion. Ah, we be British soldiers, two men of the ninth. Why, you're a Roman. I so. Uh, Civis Romanus Sum. <laughs> I have not the Latin see. Though I'm a Roman citizen, you British? I so we all are. All English born, but Romans. There have been no true born Roman in the ninth since days of Constantius more than a hundred years ago. What uh, what year is this? Why eleven hundred and sixty three. Ah, this can't. There were no Romans in Britain in 1163. Why, uh, why, why, Henry II was king of England then. What is this? Uh, wait. Anno Domini? No, I don't want to be scunditized. Uh, the army we use the old style from the founding of Rome. Well, aren't you Christians then? Oh, we're Christians, many of us. Greg? Uh, let me see, uh, Rome was founded in... 753 B.C. 753 from 1163, uh, 410. This is A.D. 410. Uh, I... Uh, look, soldier, the, the legions go back to Rome next year, don't they? How know you that? I, I just know it. Hey, it's, it's true. It would be a sad day of parting for most of us. For we have never known any other land save this where we were born. Yes, I remember reading about that. What? Look, man. Eh? What, uh, what about us? What? Why, man? Come and have supper with us, comrades. There's always room at the mess for a British soldier. And there'll be wine issue later. And our wives and our families are coming to join us. I could tell you about that Midsummer's Eve. I could tell you about the songs and the stories our new comrades told us about fighting the outlaws who swarmed down from the north to shatter themselves against the stones of the Wall of Severus. And I could tell you of the women, the wives and daughters of the legionaries, the ones who danced, the ones who poured the heavy, sour red wine and drank with us out of sweaty leather helmets. I could tell you of Lance Corporal Edward Mullen brimming with that wine, drilling a squad of Roman soldiers, teaching them the manual of arms with their lances, even to the hollow of the right foot against the heel of the left when they came to present. And me, I was applauded loudly when I stood forth and declaimed, Arma Verumque Cano. And followed right through in my best Lakeview High School elegance until I fell flat on my face at the sixth line. And flat on my face I was when the sun came up on Midsummer's Day in the year of our Lord, 410. Flat on my face with 60 Roman legionaries, none of whom had a worse hangover than the one I sported. That was when I discovered a strange thing. My watch was running backward. Perhaps that was an effect, not a cause. 
Perhaps the druid had laid a spell on it that made it, in time, run backwards. Perhaps the going backward in time had affected the watch. I don't know even today. But I have an idea. And tonight, I'm going to find out. The legionaries accepted us. We accept the damn as soldiers are quite apt to do. In time of war, everything is wrong. We were there. We saw no way of returning, so we refused to bother our heads about it. Well, perhaps we were influenced by Elaine. Elaine, the daughter of our friend, the legionary who had first greeted us. His name was Spurius Decius Athelstan Hogwick. Elaine, and I fell in love with her. And Edward Mullen fell in love with her. I remember how we talked one early fall day beside the wall. Elaine and I. I do hate to go. Well, your father will probably be discharged as soon as he gets back to Rome. And you'll just have to come back here. I'd like the trip. Well, I'd take you to Rome, Elaine. Would you, Chris? And not in a troop ship, either. I'd like that. Elaine. Hmm? What if I asked your father? Well... May I? No, Greg, don't. Well, why not? Well... Don't you love me? I love you, Elaine. I like you, Greg. I, I try to make you very happy. Greg. Well? No. When you come back then? Elaine? When I come back? When I come back, Greg? Mullen and I are going to be married. And I talked to Edward Mullen, my friend. And he talked to me. I don't know what to say, Greg. I know you love her. Yes. But, Edward, I I can't stay here then. Why? Well, I can't stay here and see you and Elaine. I, I just can't do it. It's not... I can't do it. You'll have to stay, Greg. No. Why? Elaine likes you. Uh, look, old boy... We're friends, aren't we? Of course we're friends. But don't Let's you... always be friends. Uh, where could you go? Maybe I should go back, Edward. How? I'm going to find the druid. <laughs> you don't know where he is. I'm going to the circle. Greg, I don't be a fool. No. Well, what if you can't find him? Well, the legion will be gone soon. Uh, I'll go over to the other side if I can't get back where I belong. You won't do that. Listen, Edward, I can do as I please. Greg, no. Can't you see that I I don't ever want to see you again? Can't you understand that you're taking from me the one thing? It was a fair contest, Greg. Fair contest or no fair contest? Do you think I'm going to stay here in this godforsaken place and see you in the lane every day? And... Well, don't you understand? I'm sorry, Greg. I've got to leave. I know. I hope you'll forgive me someday, old friend. I'll never forgive you. I wish I hadn't said that to Edward Mullen. Because I know now I didn't mean it. I knew I didn't mean it a few short hours after I'd said it. I went to the circle that night. At midnight. I stood and looked around me. I could just make out the distant light from the sentry's godfire alongside the wall. I looked up at the moon and at the shadows of the stones on the green sword. And I listened to the rustling of the leaves of the ancient oaks. And I spoke aloud. Druid, I said, Druid, I need you. Druid, come to me. And 
I looked down at my wristwatch. And the minute hand slowly moved backward until it touched the figure of 12. It was midnight. And again I heard the solemn tone of the great bell. And from the shadows, the old druid walked slowly toward me. I raised my hand. Druid. I said. Druid. Let me go back. Druid, I must go back. And the old man halted by my side. And I saw an infinity of pity in those wise old eyes. And I said again. Let me go back. I felt his hands on my arm. And he unfastened my watch and held it up. And from the shadow under the great oak, Edward Mullen and Elaine came toward me. Silently, he fastened the watch on Edward's wrist. And Edward raised his other hand in solemn, final salute. And as the druid lifted his staff and the veil seemed to slip over the moon, there was a sudden scream from Elaine. And dimly I saw a crowd of shaggy, howling men pull over the wall and race toward my two friends. And brazen trumpets sounded in the darkness as I screamed, No! No, let me come back! The wild, savage men of the North had chosen that moment for their attack. And I had deserted my friend and the woman I loved in the hour of their virus. And it was 30 years ago that the Red Cap MP found me and got me back to camp. But they never found Edward Mullen. Once Lance Corporal of the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry, and late legionary in the Ninth Legion of Rome, the slow but sure legion. So now Midsummer's Eve is nearly here, and I must have my watch back. And perhaps the Druid will let me come back to the Ninth and start over. Maybe I can help if I can get there in time. Maybe not. That skeleton with the wristwatch, with my wristwatch, his right arm was lifted in a very military, final British Army salute. <laughs> The title of tonight's Quiet Please story was Not Responsible After 30 Years. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper, and the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And J. Pat O'Malley played Edward Mullen. The legionary was Court Benson, and his daughter Elaine was Nancy Sargent. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week, my good friend Willis Cooper. People you heard tonight are not intended to be anyone you know or even anyone you don't know. They're products of my typewriter, and it's fictitious as all get out. And next week's Quiet Please story will be entitled What the Lilies Consider. It's about a man who loves flowers and vice versa. And so until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Tonight's Quiet Please show was especially written for your enjoyment, with the hope we would please many people with many different tastes for many different reasons. You like Quiet Please for one reason and you for another. And that's just as it should be. For we in America aren't stamped with a mold. We have our differences, differences in tastes and talents, in hopes and ambitions, in color and creed. Our American differences have resulted in a variety of contributions which have made our country great and kept us free. Today, as America seeks to establish peace in the world and to continue prosperity at home, 
Our differences must not divide us or hamper our efforts. On this flag day of 1948, let each of us pledge to wipe group prejudice out of our lives by meeting every American as an individual. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Thank you.